people, your soldiers! Eddie's back! Study up! They're not civilians anymore! Take too long to act like this! They're going to Cuba to kill Spaniards! Hello, and welcome to yet another episode of the Lines Led by Donkeys podcast. And like it just ruined my intro. Yeah. I am Joe. And with me today, as always, for the most part, is Nick. And uh, you all know Laika, the podcast dog, who just ruined my intro. Hello, Laika. Now, uh, so we have wanted to do some earlier American episodes for quite some time. Like, we've, we've dicked around the Civil War a few times. Uh, we've talked about the War of 1812, which is our first series. But there's, like, that weird interim period between, like, America being nothing on the global stage and then, like, World War II. Yeah. Um, obviously World War One's in there, but <clears throat> we kind of get a participation trophy for that award because yeah, it sure. was mostly already over. But uh, so we thought we would talk about America's first overseas war of empire, and that is the Philippines American War. Are you familiar Ooh, with this war at all? Not really, honestly. You know, and this is where I say either was I, because uh, before we start, I have to thank. Uh, Robert Chang. So Robert was the lead researcher in this episode, meaning it's the first episode where that was not me, uh, mm. which means it's probably going to be the best one. Uh, <laughs> he's a history grad, and he's an activist with the International Coalition on Human Rights in the Philippines. He did virtually all the legwork That's awesome. uh, for this series. Um, and he also provided me with a pronunciation guide with it for the Tagalog language, which I will still fuck up. If you get... We're... Damn near 100 episodes into this podcast, and uh, everybody knows that I can't pronounce a goddamn thing correctly. Uh, so, Robert, well known. thank you for giving me a pronunciation guide, but I, I'm so sorry for what I'm about to do to your language. <laughs> is it on? Is it like the ones for the dictionary? Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. It, it is the most dumb proof thing I think I've ever read, and I will still ruin it. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I'm guilty of being very, very, very ignorant when it comes to Philippine names, uh, naming oh, conventions, yeah. anything. I'm, I'm not uh, familiar with them at all. I know a lot of, I have a lot of Filipino friends. <sighs> Their names, dude. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Insane for me. I mean, I can't really shit talk anybody when it comes to having hard to pronounce names. I grew up with the exception that no one was going to pronounce my name correctly, ever. Uh, and I've been mostly correct. So like... It's pretty uh, easy. I kind of, I kind of feel everybody's pain when they listen to me uh, say whatever their national hero is, and I fuck their name up. <laughs> like I'm sorry, but like, so, I'm just so sorry. Uh, so, you know, it, this war is really interesting because um, one, for reasons that will quickly become apparent, it's very, very clear that America has never learned a fucking thing. No, dude. When it comes to anything. You don't need to. Uh, yeah, the, the American exceptionalism is being able to be at war f- uh, at uh, somewhere for 20 years and no one being able to find it in a map. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's there was a saying, I do not remember who said it's like, the easiest way to teach Americans ge- uh, geography is just like invade it. <laughs> but like, that's also not true because I know like dozens of soldiers who think Afghanistan's in the Middle East. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, I remember when I was in Afghanistan, people who had done tours in Iraq were attempting to speak Arabic to people. Oh. Like, bro, you are thousands of miles off. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. It was real bad. Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, well, our cultural sensitivity class, or whatever it is that they called it uh, before we deployed, was given by a white guy from Montana. So it's probably not a good, <laughs> a good, a good prelude there. But... um. I think that's why this war ended up being, I think, my favorite series that we've done. Uh, and that includes like, the Soviet-Afghan War and Iran-Iraq. Maybe for different reasons. Uh, I'm, my, uh, my opinions on it are, are, are skewed because like, I researched the Soviet-Afghan War for fucking months. Right. Uh, so I, of course, I have to say, yeah, it's great. But like, this one will absolutely lay a ground map or the groundwork, whatever you want to call it, to how the fuck we ended up where we are today to a frightening degree. And a lot of, uh, you're making this sound really good. And a lot of familiar names are going to pop up. Uh, So before we talk about the American Philippines war, we have to explain exactly how they ended up uh, at that point. So that means diving into a little bit of uh, pre Spanish uh, Philippines history. Uh, So the, the history of the Philippines um, is 
well, it, it's not like a country until Spain shows up. It's uh, an archipelago made up of around 7,000 islands, 175 different ethnic groups, and 120 different languages. Uh, oui. And that that's like, and there's like 100 different ethnic groups, and um, all this on a landmass, it's about the same size as Arizona. So it's it's a the Philippines, a land of contrast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, now, before the intervention of the Spanish, like I said, the nation state that we know and conceptualize today simply did not exist. Instead, the islands were populated with dozens, if not hundreds, of different tribes, each a little different from each other. Some were communes, while others were fiefs um, who would enslave their neighbors when they defeated them in war. Mm. Some of these areas were feudal nations in their own right, ruled by rajas, and their fiefs, their fiefs ruled by lords or chiefs known as datus. Many of these datus actually had soothsayers known as babalons, who were something of like a spiritual advisor. Uh, these babalons were almost always women, and in many cases were trans. So like that is significantly more progressive than I ever expected yeah. a feudalist society. I wasn't to expecting be. that, yeah. to be honest. Yeah, like what now I of course I'm I'm whitewashing our history a bit here when I say like when I think of feudalism, I think of like Western European feudalism, uh, which is obviously much different, but yeah, I didn't expect that. Uh, though this way of life was doomed once the Spaniards showed up, uh, which can be said for a lot of different countries. Oh, yeah. uh, while the Datus and the Rajas fought back, one Datu named Lapu Lapu speared famous explorer Fernand Magellan right in the asshole. <laughs> Quite literally. Uh, hoisted him up like a fucking <laughs> piece of game. Awesome. Uh, and like kept the, the Iwo Jima flag. <laughs> Oh, God damn it! Can that be a can that be a fucking design? <laughs> it's just some dude flailing. <laughs> I want the Iwo Jima. Like we've already done that with the Emu War. Now I want to see Fernand Magellan just fucking spit roasted on a mountaintop. Uh, now, once he kept his body as a war trophy, it was all but certain that their homelands would eventually fall, like so many others, to the Spanish crown. Uh, the Spaniards named their new captured uh, group of islands the Philippines, named after King Philip II. Uh, so fuck that guy. Yeah. Wow. Uh, no good kings. Only one good emperor. Uh, we all know who oh, it is. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, once in charge, the Spaniards did what they tended to do: horribly press the native population. They instituted things like pollo y servicio, uh, which is where all the men of the nation, uh, age twelve, uh, start starting from age twelve, uh, were forced into forty consecutive days of brutally hard labor. They did things like clay roads, cut trees, construction, and farming. For 40 days. Yeah, uh, it, like nonstop. Once a year. Oh, that uh, sucks. Because this was effectively child slavery uh, on a temporary scale, uh, many people just died during those 40 days. That's how they got around it. Yeah. It's temporary. You only have to do it once a year. Yeah. Or just once ever, probably. <laughs> yeah, once ever. Yeah. And this is actually really, really common. It was like called the Corvier system in Europe. Um, and like other nations still kind of do the same thing. Like, I think it's like Tajikistan that still forces people to go work the fields. Um, a lot of, uh, I think Uzbekistan, they have to go to the fields and we're like pick cotton, uh, for like, I think it's like two months every year, like doctors and shit. Yeah. Wow. And like, it's fucking stupid. <laughs> yeah. This one is a little bit worse, uh, because it, it effectively turned into a, a bit of a child genocide on accident Jeez. or on purpose. It's the Spaniards. It could go either way. Uh, just when 40 days of slavery was not enough, the Spaniards simply enslaved people forever so they could work on giant plantations known as haciendas, which is, uh, yeah, that's where actually where that term comes from. It's, uh, that's not good. <laughs> yeah. yeah I not... think I've eaten at a <laughs> some place that said they were. <laughs> yeah. That's like uh, eating, uh, I don't know, like country, what's it called? Uh, soul food. It's like eating soul food at like, called like. Uncle Billy Slave Plantation. Oh, like, man. <laughs> fuck, I don't want to eat there. <laughs> but it's soul food. Yeah. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a huge fan, which is why I had to think of that for a second. Um, yeah. Um, so they would... What You're they not a would, huge fan of soul food? No, I'm not. Mm. I'm too... I, I am... It's a lot like I'm too white for a lot of um, spicy food. I'm too white to appreciate soul food. And I'll, I actually, and, and I'll accept that. Like, I actually saw that today, like how... Weird people react to like Takis. Really? Yeah. I enjoy Takis. They taste fucking delicious. They're too spicy for me. So I was watching I'm the this whitest man show on YouTube the where they try to make it gourmet style, like homemade. And all these people, all these chefs are trying it and they try one chip and they're just like, ah, it's, ah. I was just like, fucking really? 
I smash those bags, dude. Like it's it's awesome. Uh, it's almost like I'm above people sometimes. <laughs> yeah, the, the 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 line for superiority is Takis. Yeah, <laughs> which means I'm definitely uh, subpar. Which I already. But do. then you can come up to some other shit, and I'd just be fucking under somebody's boot. Yeah, it's fair. Oh, they have that uh, death chip or whatever that's made with like ghost peppers oh, and shit. Yeah, it's I've like one that. chip that comes in like a mylar ceiling thing. It's I, not good. Of course, it's not. It just it's tastes like terrible. I mean, that's those aren't. It's not about flavor at that point. It's it's about physical punishment. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't like your asshole at that point. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it should come as a surprise to absolutely nobody that during their time as the island's colonial masters, the Spanish had to deal with around 200 different rebellions and various uprisings of different shapes and colors, uh, all of which they handled in one very specific way. Kill everything with a pulse. Oh. Yeah. I'm always down for a rebellion. I love rampages. Uh, yeah. In, in one instance, the local populace now having been... No, uh, one of the, the things that happens through most colonial periods, especially whenever the, the Spaniards colonize anybody, is they would try to win them over through their religion. It, it was one of the ways that they colonialize or civilize the yeah. masses. It's the same reason why it's really strange that someone in a really far away island is just like really dedicated to the Pope, yeah. which is exactly how it, the Philippines ended up that way through the Spanish. Um, Bastards. Uh, and they bought into the Catholic religion, but eventually they're like, wait, why can't we be priests? And uh, when, so eventually the church caved and allowed uh, Filipinos to become priests. Uh, once they did, the newly ordained Filipino priests helped a group of Spanish trained Filipino soldiers launch an uprising. Yeah. Because I mean, like, if you really are like a godly person, you'd be like, this is kind of fucked. Yeah. Right. Because, <laughs> um, you know, like, I remember vividly because I had to read the Bible growing up. Jesus, who is. Did a, you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it was a meaning Orthodox, but you know, same, same. It's all the same shit, different hats. Very true. Um, you know, there's there's a part of the Bible where everyone's like, well, Jesus always turned the other cheek. Well, there's also a part where he whips a motherfucker. So, like, yeah. Uh, yeah. <sighs> now, eventually, this rebellion was crushed, uh, and the Filipinos are, once again, banned from the priesthood. Uh, just to underline how the Spanish felt about the entire situation, they had three priests executed by Garot. Oh, God. Oh, Garot? Are you familiar with the Garot? Yes. So, for people who are not familiar my, with the uh, Garot... Secondary weapon. Uh, so that would actually be better than the one that they used back then. Now, um, the, fuck they use? the garrot was a metal collar that was attached to a wooden board and a, a, something that was akin to like a, a giant corkscrew system. And it would slowly be tightened down by a crank, slowly strangling uh, somebody with see, I'm a thinking giant of the metal handheld bar. one, like the mafia style garrot. I feel like that would be much faster. I don't know. Uh, if you think this is some medieval shit, well, you would be correct. But you should also know that the Spanish carried out capital punishment via garrot until the 1950s. Really? Yeah. Thanks, Franco. Yeah. Wow. What do you th- if the dude was anything like us, like the executioner, he'd be saying, go to sleep, bitch. Like, you probably. Probably more than that, though. I mean, it, like, it, when you see a picture, it's, it's like a chair. It's like It looks like an electric chair, where the person's strapped down, like their arm's like strapped down. But instead of having, like, a electric hat effectively I'm not I'm not a, I'm not a death it's an electric penalty. wire yeah uh it, it it's like the the collar is clamped to the the chair and there's just a giant corkscrew behind it uh that slowly tightens it down yeah and because awesome. it's a metal collar there's like no fast way to die from this it's awful Ugh. uh but slowly liberal european ideals began to trickle into the islands and the newly elevated middle class of the philippines began to send their children to european schools one of those men was Andreas Bonapasio, uh, and he returned to the Philippines in 1892 and found the most honorable society of the country's sons and daughters, which, I mean, that, that is what it is, says in English. Uh, hilariously enough, in the native Tagalog language, it's abbreviated to KKK, and I cannot pronounce those words, but I did have Robert pronounce them for me. Hey, this is Rob, the research assistant for the episode, and it's pronounced... Kata astaasang, kagalagalanggang, katipunan na maga anak ng bayan, or katipunan for short. So yeah, KKK. Uh, they also had a pretty bitchin initiation ritual uh, for the oh, new members. Oh fuck yeah, they do. Now the new members of the KKK. 
I, this I know I so should, bad. I know I shouldn't find this so funny, but this I do. It sounds so bad. Uh, now, they blindfolded men and led them into a dimly lit room that had a skull, revolver, and cutlass in it. Oh, what? Yeah, yeah. If the applicant responded satisfactory to questions put to him, he was then initiated into the secret society by the means of a blood compact from an incision on his arm made with the sword. The initiate drew blood, uh, so he'd be bleeding out of his arm, dip his fingers in the blood, then he'd write his name. Oh, I'd be so fucked, because I'm so bad under pressure with questions, <laughs> I'll come up with random shit. Like, for boards? Oh, man. Initiate Nick. Why do you want to serve the freedom of the Philippines? Fuck. Uh, My asshole! <laughs> I plead the fifth. Oh, God damn it, just shoot him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you'd also have to take a new name, like a revolutionary what? name. Yeah. Yeah, it's like code name. Oh, code name. Yeah, cool guys got code, code names. Fuck yeah, dude. It's what like, would be your code name? Uh, uh, platypus. Oh, okay. No one ever suspects the platypus. Okay. Also because uh, I have toes growing on the back of my feet, which inject venom. <laughs> it's very, very specific uh, birth defect that I have. That's awesome. Now, with any society with a blood oath, the KKK... <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> dedicated its violent, uh, dedicated itself to the violent overthrow of Spanish rule on the islands. Now, Bonapasio and the KKK. Now, if you haven't noticed, I made sure to write KKK as much as possible because it's never not funny. It almost sounds like the South is trying to fight the Spanish. The South will rise again. Oh, <laughs> fuck, we're lost. Yeah. No, I, I, I really don't want to compare the two, but like, because this is the only time in human history the KKK has been cool. And it has to be, <laughs> and it has to be ten thousand miles away from the American yeah. South. <laughs> and then it still has fucking idiots like us giggling at its name. Uh, we're gonna be haunted by Bonapasio in our sleep tonight. Uh, yeah, they dedicate themselves to the violent overthrow of the Spanish government, or the, the the Spanish Philippines government, because they knew that like talking to him wasn't gonna work. Um, talking never works. No, I mean, it's it, only time for action. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely something to be. I can't, I won't speak too much on, on on that, but there's definitely something to be said uh, uh, to direct action because, like, you can't negotiate some way with, with people that want you dead. There's no point. Right now, uh, Bonapasio and his group um, would form something of a shadow insurgent government. Uh, like they they started uh, appointing people to positions in which a government that would exist if they won. Um. But this is where Bonapasio kind of pisses a lot of people off. He knew for this new government, if they were to win, was going to need the support of that enlightened, so to speak, middle class that had been educated in Europe. Unfortunately, okay. most of the wealth that was in Filipino hands was centralized in those people's pockets. So he was effectively getting rid of one colonial master for the bourgeoisie of the Filipino society right. which had been elevated by the spanish you can see how that could piss a lot yeah. of people off i mean that i liked him up until now <laughs> um most of them also happen to be his friends <laughs> really <laughs> yeah he's Whoops. not looking too good no no you either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain wow yeah you either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become a class traitor that's, that's generally how that works um uh, Eventually, his own comrades would hack him to death with the machetes. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> well, is it because of that? Someone drew Bonapasio in close and is like, no war, but class war. And they started <laughs> hacking him to death with machetes. I thought it could have been over something like simple. That'd, no, be, I, that'd be great. <laughs> there is not a problem too big that cannot be solved with hacking some, someone to death with a machete. That's just the way the world works. I mean, the bigger the problem, the bigger the machete. Wait, my last lumpia. Oh, my bad. I did. Global warming? We're we need a really big guy. machete. And they'll fix everything. <laughs> Global war on terror? Machete. Uh, drug war? Machete. Uh, what else have we got here? Well, I mean, I would say uh, wealth inequality, but we need a guillotine for that. <laughs> LeMay. Which, I mean, what is a guillotine but a machete in a frame? See? It all <laughs> comes back to machetes. <laughs> Uh, now the problem was is when the comrades hacked him to death, the 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 insurgent government kind of became unstable. Now remember, they're still fighting the Spanish. Uh, they knew that they no longer had the power to win, so they decided to accept the deal that the Spanish had offered them uh, to be sent into exile in the Hong Kong, along with about four hundred thousand dollars 
in uh, 1897. So it'd be uh, over a million dollars for sure. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's kind of a shitty deal because like only the leadership could fuck off to Hong Kong. Yeah. So like all the, the, the rank and file, the people were just kind of fucking left You're in the Philippines fucked. to die. <laughs> it's like, God damn, these guys all suck. Now, if you paid attention to the date of that exile, you would see it's only one year away from the beginning of the Spanish-American War. Eventually, the Cuban revolutionaries had erupted in a revolt against Spain. At the time, U.S. President William McKinley uh, had actively been trying to find ways to end that revolt. Not because he cared about the, Cub- the Cubans or the liberation of the island, of course, but because it was hurting U.S. corporations, which had a stake in Spanish-dominated Cuba. Bastards. We are nothing if not consistent. God damn it. <laughs> Uh, as the revolt grew and grew, the USS Maine was dispatched as something of a show of force. No! <laughs> uh, showing Spain that the US was watching the situation and they strongly disapproved of their bullshit. Uh, it did not exactly work out. On February 15th, 1898, the USS Maine exploded off the coast of Havana, Cuba, killing 266 sailors. Now, today we know this was almost certainly due to some kind of mechanical failure. Yeah. Uh, no evidence has ever been proved of sabotage. Uh, now, the press at the time blamed the Spanish and demanded war. <laughs> this so-called yellow journalism, uh, now you would know that as like tabloid journalism or Fox News, um, hmm. pretty much created an American cause for the war out of thin air. They coined slogans like, to hell with Spain, remember the main. And ran it's not good. And ran headlines. I mean, I'll give him credit. It's catchy. Yeah. It's not even that catchy. <laughs> I mean, if I'm going to pick soulless propaganda for right. war, like, you could do worse. Uh, and ran headlines with, who destroyed the main? $50,000 reward and Spanish treachery. That one's terrible. <laughs> and, that, like, every single time, these are, like, headlines that take up, like, half the fucking page. And oh, sh- yeah. I yeah. see that shit. Uh, they also openly talked about Spanish atrocities against the Cuban population. Which, should be pointed out, were absolutely true and terrible. But before then, nobody gave a shit. Pretty much. They were only trying to... It was like... Um, now, the, I, actually, it's not a good example. I was going to point out to um, uh, the crimes that people point out that Saddam Hussein committed before the Gulf War in, in Kuwait. Those did not happen, uh, for the most part. Uh, but the, the, the Spanish really were awful to, to the Cubans. Um, I'm not saying they lied about that. It's like... Um, Actually, a good example is when ISIS uh, was slaughtering their way through the Yazidi population, and you saw that everywhere. Yeah. But, like, then it just stopped. It's because nobody gave a shit about the Yazidis. They just needed to hold up a tragedy plaything. It's like, uh, and you see the op- opposite of that going on now with the mainstream uh, narrative where, like, everybody's really mad that we pulled out from northern Syria in, in, in Rojava and allowed the, Tur- the, the Turks to kill the Rojavan revolution. But you really only see certain people be like, they're definitely going to commit genocide, guys. Like, we don't really... Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, because it, it's not uh, beneficial to the government's tagline to be like, yes, we caused a genocide. <laughs> they only trot out these trauma figures uh, to, 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 like, for, to start wars. Um, yeah, and they did that to the, the Cubans. Obviously, America didn't care about Cuba for obvious reasons, which we will talk about when the war is over. Um, furthermore, uh, the Cuba Libre movement or the Cuban Liberation Movement had a pretty strong foothold in the United States, including several offices in Florida, like legitimate offices. Like they leased out a fucking nice little, almost like a mall, like a strip it, mall. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely That's like awesome. um, like somebody trying to sell you salt from a cart out front yeah. of it. Like, just wash your hands. Oh, there's a lot of those. Yeah. yeah oh my they're god. Terrible. Um, Have you ever done it? Yeah, yeah. I did it once. They almost sell, they almost sold it to me until like, yeah, it's eighty dollars. Like, bro, this is salt. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. I never got to the point where they told me how much it costs. Definitely did have it done to my hands though. It was nice. Yeah. Uh now it should be said, and I I would be remiss as the not real historian that I am, if I blame the media for the war entirely. That's not true. But what it did do is put the public narrative behind the war, which is pretty important if you live in a semi-free democracy like the United States where people can vote you the fuck out for starting bad wars. Now, remember, this is hypothetical because that doesn't happen, but yeah. <laughs> people don't get voted out for doing that shit anymore. Um, 
But what it did is everybody's like, yeah, maybe we should fight Spain. Because, like, Spain hasn't been a traditional enemy of the United States fucking ever. But it gives you the idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, thank God that never fucking happened again, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it should be pointed out that not, that uh, not a lot of pushing was needed for America to get into the Empire game. This is something that America had been thinking of for quite some time. And a lot of it can be traced back to U.S. Navy Captain Alfred Mahan when he published a book called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. Um, it kind of just overtly called for an American overseas empire. Uh, really? As something of like an outpost uh, uh, system for the United States Navy to, right. to expand our sphere of influence. Um, I mean, America had at least designs on the Western Hemisphere uh, for an empire for a long time. Hence why the Monroe Doctrine was like the whole thing was expanding sphere of influence right. and expanding American power. They wanted to keep other powers away while expanding, while expanding their own. That's the only reason why it existed. Mahan himself really bought in this idea as well uh, as the expansion of American uh, power into Central America uh, to establish a canal system to facilitate faster travel. Mm, Now, anybody listening today now knows that happened, and that's the only reason why the country of Panama exists. We literally stole it (laughs) to build a canal. Um, One of Mahan's biggest fans was none other than future U.S. President and currently Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Teddy Roosevelt. Once Teddy rose to power in the U.S. Navy, he used Mahan's book as something of a blueprint for the modernization that it would need for his dream to become possible. Teddy had been cheering for a war against Spain to liberate Cuba for a really long time. Now, this isn't because Teddy really cared about the Cubans. He just really enjoyed war. And, like, he he was a person that was very clearly some kind of psychopath while doing incredibly cool things. Um, What do you mean by cool? Like, um... One time he was written a letter by a U.S. cavalry trooper that complained uh, because this is like back when you could just write a letter to the yeah. president. And he'll actually read it. Yeah. Yeah. And not only did he answer, uh, he read it, he answered it. Uh, the trooper complained about how long um, he, he was forced to ride uh, during training. It was like 20, 30 miles, something like that. I don't know exactly uh, how long the distance was. So Teddy jumped on his horse and rode fucking two times that just to prove him wrong. How the fuck is he going to prove that? What? That he did it? Yeah. Because he's Teddy Roosevelt. And mo- I could tell you something that Teddy Roosevelt did, and most people probably believe that he did it. There's a reason why there's a picture of him riding a moose. No, it, gr- it didn't actually happen. It's photoshopped, very obviously, but it's Teddy Roosevelt. So he's like, yeah, he probably did that. You don't fucking ride moose. He might have. He fucked a moose. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> He, he pinned a moose down and made his lover. <laughs> yeah. oh, but like, God. yeah, I mean, he's someone to, like he had a fake frontier spirit too. Like he was like the most successful propaganda president on earth. It was like, yeah, he's this, I mean, he commanded the Rough Riders. He's oh, this, that, he's this yeah. guy, you know, but like when he did go out West to, to like be a badass. He was like brought to ruins. All of his farm animals died and he couldn't farm for shit. <laughs> but like nobody ever hears about that. It's true. He just about froze to death. And like, I think it was like a Dakota or something like that. But like, so what he gets for going out to Dakota. But this is a guy who never saw a war he didn't like. He is Tom Cotton. If Tom Cotton became president, which he will in like 10 years. And in which case we are both going to be executed. <laughs> like if you brought up a war to Teddy Roosevelt, he's like, yeah, sure. But yeah, let's do it. Like the Spanish empire was literally just off the coast of Florida. Like, those goddamn Ameri- got close to America touchers will show them. <laughs> um, they said I didn't ride that moose. Those fuckers. Yeah. <laughs> now, once the war started, the majority of the ground fighting would happen in Cuba in places most people have heard of, like San Juan Hill. Uh, there was also an incident where U.S. soldiers were sent to capture Guam, only to find out the Spanish troops stationed there had no idea they were at war. <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, this is the 1800s. It's not like they're to call oh, that's them. true, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So when America opened fire, they thought it was a salute. <laughs> they <were> fucking salute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Afterwards, the Spanish surrendered. Yeah. Uh, it was kind of a dumb war. Anyway, uh, the U.S. fleet under the command of Commodore James Dewey attacked Manila Bay in the first action of the war. Overall, on 11, 11 days after the war was declared, because they were already on their way there. <laughs> The U.S. fleet destro- destroyed the Spanish fleet so completely it all but crushed the overseas colonial period for the Spanish Empire. 
the only sailor the U.S. lost in the battle was one man who died of heat stroke. <laughs> what? <laughs> Was he down in the boiler room or some shit? <laughs> I don't fucking know. <laughs> Just imagine, like, you have, like, a, a historic victory. Everybody's like, we did it! Oh, fuck, Pete died. <laughs> He's just on the deck, but he has that fucking suntan mirror. <laughs> <laughs> the entire Pacific uh, uh, Spanish squadron was destroyed, and, like, one guy named Frank killed over and died from heat stroke. <laughs> the Americans contacted... Oh, I wonder how that letter went to his family. I think they just kicked him overboard. Nobody ever talked about it. <laughs> cool him off. Yeet that motherfucker into the sea. We can't have any blemishes on this victory. I think this is how we uh, cure his heat stroke. <laughs> give, him a, give him the Bin Laden treatment. Just dump, <laughs> dump him in the sea. Later, Megatron. The Americans contacted the former rebel government of Panapasio, who had run to Hong Kong for $400,000 and a free house. Uh, nice. And so... The U.S. gave them the impression that if they uh, that they would aid the Philippine struggle for independence, if they in turn supported the American effort to defeat the Spanish on the Philippines. The former head of the rebel government, uh, who was now in charge of it, though in exile, was named Emilio Aginaldo. Uh, I probably butchered that. Uh, immediately agreed and said he could bring about thirty thousand loyal troops back with him. Nice. I don't know if that was true or not, but that's what he said. Hey. Now, it is important to point out here that they had a verbal agreement. Agreeing upon, uh, so they, the agreement was between Emilio and Commodore Dewey, along with a U.S. consul named Spencer Pratt. With, and like anybody with the first name Spencer, you just can't trust him. No. Um, it was a Preston, said that, Spencer. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody named after a truck or a gun. That too. Or Harley. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. So it was decided that no written agreement of any kind would be needed. Pratt pointed out to Emilio that the U.S. could be trusted. And his word was as good as the U.S. government and the word of the President of the United States. All those things are meaningless, but yeah. yeah. So, uh, Emilio later pointed all this out, and Pratt said he was lying, and no discretion, discussions of a political nature had occurred at all. This is kind of strange, because remember, he was speaking to the former head of a rebel government who was striving for an independent nation for years. Literally the only discussion they were ever going to have would be political in nature. I think Pratt might be lying. Yeah. Is there more hatcheting coming up? Oh, yeah. Sweet. Whole lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> now, if anybody in this... I feel it coming. I don't there's, know why. There's quite a few people in this series that require good macheting. Pratt's one of them, for sure. It sounds like it. So, the U.S. sent a steamer to pick Emilio up and bring him back home. <laughs> steamer. <laughs> it's just, a, just a duke floating yeah. to the ocean. <laughs> you fucking, we're on the safe wavelength <laughs> when I heard that. I, when I wrote the script, I knew you were going to giggle at Steamer, Steamer, and I would immediately laugh, too, because I'm a simple, simple man. <laughs> uh, Emilio pretty much began putting together a government as soon as he hit the ground for what he thought would soon be an independent country. Emilio would be wrong! <laughs> at this point, American forces with Filipino support had all but defeated the Spanish soldiers stationed on the island, which was made easier by the fact that the islands were thinly garrisoned by the Spanish army, leaving little more... Something of akin to a mop-up exercise wherever they went. That was the only place that was not really the case was the capital of Manila, which, unlike the others, the Spanish actually dug in and prepared for a siege. Mostly because their backs were against the wall and they had nowhere else to go. Yeah. Because their entire uh, their navy, navy had gotten nuked. Gone. <laughs> uh, the Americans settled in for a siege while their Filipino allies wanted to go in for an attack. The Spanish had their backs against the wall and they were really not fighting anymore. They were more like just shooting enough to let you know that they were de going to defend themselves and not be overran. That was pretty much it. They didn't want to fight anymore. I wouldn't either. The Filipinos knew this and were rearing to go, but the Americans uh, wanted to stall for time. They told their allies that they needed more time so, so more soldiers could show up, and a protracted siege was better for their tactics. It quickly became apparent to the Filipinos, who were fighting alongside the Americans, that the Americans did not see them as equals or even allies. The U.S. did its best to keep the Filipino troops at arm's length and made sure not to overtly fight alongside them. Commodore Dewey said of the matter, quote, It's my policy to avoid any alliances with the insurgents. While I appreciate that pending the arrival of our troops, they may be of use. Now, if you can't pick up the old-timey burn there, yeah. that meant that Filipino troops were only useful to throw against the Spanish to stall them. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Fucking Turns assholes. out Dewey's kind of an asshole. Yeah. Eventually, 19,000 Americans would arrive to the island. Still, the Allied armies sat around and waited. 
Nice. For some reason, the Americans were just not pressing the attack. Well, that was because Commodore Dewey had been locked in secret negotiations with Spanish General Fermín Juárez, commander of the Manila Garrison. They'd come up with a plan to fake a battle. How the fuck were they <laughs> going to do that? Now, no real, no real resistance would be given, and no real attack would be launched, but it would allow the general to surrender with, with his troops with honor, as the Spanish parliament had previously rejected his idea of surrender. I'm just seeing, bang, 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 bang. I got you! You're dead! <laughs> I, lay down, bitch! <laughs> uh, so it allowed the Spanish to surrender to American troops. In the mind of a racist imperialist, it was considered much more respectful, as no real gentleman would ever be caught surrendering to the natives. <sighs> I really wish I was making uh, is that somebody up. getting hatchety? So, uh, close. Okay. Somebody needs to. But the most strategically important part is to let the Americans win the battle and keep the Philippine revolutionaries out of the center of the city, an area known as the Interuros, uh, thus claiming the victory for themselves and the city for America. Now, uh, the, the fake battle uh, was a lot of maneuvering with like naval ships and infantry formations, um, and then the Philippines, uh, the, the Spanish troops surrendered. Despite the fact it was really the only fake battle I've ever heard of, 46 Spanish soldiers still died, as well as six Americans. Which means, in a battle that they were supposed to fake, Spain managed to kill more soldiers than they did when their entire navy in the area was wiped out. <laughs> yeah. How do you think those six soldiers died? Uh, it was all friendly fire incidents. And, really? I, th- and I think one cannon exploded. <laughs> Holy fuck. Yeah, yeah. I thought one was going to be, one, maybe one more heat stroke. Now, uh, probably, yeah, probably. One uh, fell. One of the people in charge of this fake battle was none other than General Arthur MacArthur Jr. God damn it. Father of future general and renowned asshole of, of Douglas MacArthur and holder of a fucking stupid name. Do you think yeah, <laughs> Arthur <laughs> MacArthur is fucking Who so bad? Who their son that? Hey, that's kind of catchy. Let's name <laughs> Arthur MacArthur. This is what happens when you have like severe brain damage and have to name your son. Oh, I can't fucking forget it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so do you think he looked at all the other soldiers like, don't worry, my son will return. The fuck is he talking about? Yeah, my, my son will return after he's done rolling tanks over his other soldiers <laughs> that he fought with. Now, uh, you might remember Douglas MacArthur from such things as World War II, but you should instead remember him for the time he personally crushed the bonus army march in Washington, D.C. Yeah, fucking fuck him. <laughs> also, uh, for the time that he launched an invasion of the Philippines during World War II that did not need to happen. <laughs> He said he would return. Yeah, that's pretty much it. It, it was like a fucking no balls. Yeah. Yeah. Also, a stupid fucking hat and his pants to his nipples. And his big fucking corn cob pipe. Yeah. yeah he did. T- he has tits tucked into his pants. Yeah. He dressed like a pregnant woman. <laughs> At least they have an excuse because they have to have waistbands that stretch along them. He was just dumb. Yeah. Um, so all this actually happened after the U.S. and Spain agreed on peace terms to end the Spanish-American War. But because this is the 1800s, nobody had gotten word yet again. Mm. Once in control of the center of the city, the Americans barred the Filipino troops from entering it. Their own city! What the fuck? Yeah, good thing we didn't do that again. (coughs) Green zone. (coughs) Now, their excuse was the loose coalition of militias that made up the Filipino army would conduct some kind of mass slaughter of Spanish troops and civilians and some kind of crazy celebration of revenge. This is despite the fact... I mean, one... I don't blame them. And two, that had not happened yet. Rampage. E- even though like Spanish civilians were in plentiful supply all along the Filipino ar- archipelago, they did not do that. So yeah, they're just Americans being American. Yeah. This caused fierce condemnation from Filipino general Antonio Luna, who was an OG revolutionary and a certified fucking badass insane person. He was one of the few Filipinos who had European military training conducted at the Spanish Military Academy. He had been Whoa. fighting the Spanish for years, and he was not about to put up with America's shit. That may have been because he had never once seen a problem he could not kill his way out of. <laughs> Luna was a man known for being a drunken psychopath. He would so regularly get drunk and challenge people at duels only to wake up in the morning and apologize for it. It was considered normal behavior for him. <laughs> wow. What the fuck was he doing with? Machetes? Pistols? Pistols? <laughs> he was, uh, uh, now remember that when, he, uh, when I tell you that he is a, he's well known, uh, just almost more than what I just told you, for being 
a crazy strict disciplinarian in the ranks. So he was a drunken mess, but like if his soldiers followed his suit, they would get whipped. <laughs> nice. He had an explosive temper and routinely fly off the handle with for little to no reason at all. He was. Have you ever heard of being uh, promoted out of a role? Yeah. Yeah, that's what happened to him. So he got promoted to chief of war operations simply so he wouldn't actually be in direct <laughs> command of anybody anymore because <laughs> yeah. he kept punching people. <laughs> that's awesome. While America continued being a bunch of assholes, Luna went to work opening the Academy Militar, or the Philippine version of West Point, as well as designing a new standing army for his new nation based on traditional model, rather than the fractious tribal groups that he was currently dealing with. And because he hadn't done quite enough, he started a newspaper. Seriously, this guy did more in about six months yeah. than anybody has ever done in their fucking lives. In, si- in the last six months... I have done none of those things. <laughs> He's got a whole school going. Yeah, I tried to start a military academy, and it turns out that's actually called a terrorist group. <laughs> <laughs> My dog is the only person to show up. Yeah, yeah. And the, the explosive vest is very heavy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she can't quite carry oh, it. <laughs> so while the shooting war ended between uh, America and Spain in August of 1898, the actual peace treaty was not signed until December. Uh, when the U.S. and Spanish delegations officially signed the Treaty of Paris, ending the war. The treaty destroyed the Spanish overseas empire. They were forced to cede their claims and title to Cuba, which meant the U.S. would go on to indirectly control Cuba through the Platt Amendment. Are you familiar with the Platt Amendment? No. It is one of the more gold standard of American diplomatic fuckery. So Cuba would technically be Cuba. It would not be a territory of the United States. But the Platt Amendment said we could effectively do uh, punitive expeditions into Cuba if they ever did anything that pissed us off. We were Rome. What? We literally just talked about this. Yeah. So, like, if they installed a government that the U.S. didn't like, we'd invade them. I think we did, like, four times. Wow. (laughs) Spain would also hand over Puerto Rico, the West Indies, and the Marianas Islands, Guam, and the Philippines to the U.S. directly. Though technically due to the language of the treaty, the U.S. kind of bought the entire Philippines archipelago for $20 million. For those curious, that's about a half a billion dollars in today dollars, which is still a pretty fucking solid deal. If you're going to buy 700 islands or whatever, it's a solid price for it. Now, this led to a weird question that began to ask around, like, what exactly the U.S. was going to do with the Philippines? Now, the same questions were asked about Guam and Puerto Rico, but those were much closer to the United States. So people are like, well, those are kind of America. The Philippines was thousands of miles away. Yeah, it's far. Yeah. And everybody's like, are we going to have an empire, guys? I, I just was hoping they get lumpia. Because remember, like, even though we had definitely went balls deep in imperialism taking over the United States, which was then, you know, the United States from the Native Americans, we never saw it that way. Because of Manifest Destiny and all that stupid white people shit, we all consider that our land. Yeah. This was somehow different <laughs> because of the mental gymnastics required and the, the, the ethics and morals that our, our great-grandparents simply did not have. <laughs> um, now, and there's a lot of really racist newspaper clippings oh, at the time yeah. about this. Like, people are like, they, they simply can't rule themselves. They're not developed enough. Jesus. Yeah, yeah. And that is like a super common uh, imperial tagline like britain france um and belgium did the same shit throughout africa and see Asia. we have to rule them yeah they can't rule themselves they're not white yeah yeah and yeah fuck it yeah it's that's that tagline literally comes up whenever you research any imperial history of any colonized people it's like guys we've literally been ruling ourselves long and you've been in country <laughs> um now, America was new to this overseas empire game, and they weren't entirely sure if they were going to annex the entire thing yet or not. It was like, eh, kind of. Like they, they were, they were good kids on the block. They were attempting to do just the tip of empire. Right. Um, it should be pointed out, however, that a fair amount of people were strongly against this. Obviously pointing out, like, how the hell are we going to fight a war of liberation and then steal the country? This included Mark Twain, actually, who just continues to be just cool as hell. Um, but unfortunately there were way, way more voices, including the majority of the United States government who were cheering on the idea of establishing an overseas empire. Senator Albert Breveridge of Indiana, of all places, nothing good comes from Indiana, no. said, quote, 
The commercial supremacy of the Republic means that this nation is to be a sovereign factor in the peace of the world. The conflict of the future are to be conflicts of trade, struggles for markets, commercial wars for existence. You know, noted harbinger of peace, unfettered imperial capitalism. <laughs> he literally said, like, he did the, the libertarian thing of the freer the markets, the freer the people, but through colonialism somehow. He's from Indiana. You'll have yeah, to excuse is. him. And I say that our producer is from Indiana. <laughs> we love you, Nate. This is why he moved to England. It is. <laughs> Eventually, President McKinley found, finally announced the American policy of the, for the Philippines on 21 December 1898. And now, this has to be one of the most hilarious things that we've ever named in American history, more than like Operation Iraqi Freedom. He called it Benevolent Assimilation. Uh, in McKinley's announcement, he promised the Philippine people full rights that any Americans would receive, but at the same time forcing the people of the Philippines to accept American supremacy and domination. Those were the exact words. What? <laughs> you will have all this cool shit, but we will dominate But you, you have to accept your subhuman. Yeah. <laughs> now, the American authorities knew this would piss off Emilio, so they actually sent him a doctored version. Instead of American supremacy, it said free people. And the phrase to exercise American domination was removed entirely. Do you think it was just like fucking scribbled over just lightly? <laughs> just like it, when it you just put over it. When you fuck up a sworn statement, they just drew a single line yeah. through it. Like, yeah. I can still read this. Yeah. So they're just like, uh, yeah. yeah, fixed. But because the United States military is really, really dumb. Or maybe they redacted it with like a highlighter or some shit. <laughs> Another officer who had received an unaltered copy gave it to his uh, to his friend, who happened to be an officer in the Philippine military, who immediately ran and brought it to Emilio. <laughs> Check this out. Like, like, bro, what the fuck? who Why? was not fucking happy? While all this was going on, the Philippine people were still trying to get along with their lives. I mean, they had been through a lot of shit. And well, all right, the Spanish are gone. And the Americans are here. What does that really change? We don't have to go out and be slaves in the field for Ooh, 40 days. We don't have days. to work for 40 days straight. Yeah. Uh, this include uh, being able to set up a government. Because remember, they thought they were going to be an independent country. Right. Any second. They got a cool new, like, West Point. Uh, they already, I mean, they already have one so of those. Cool. Now they have to set up, like, a parliament. They got to get a, a president, all that sort of shit. Our boy Emilio was hard at work drafting up a constitution with this cabinet. You know, doing the things you expect a new government to do. They once again, they, so they declared the existence of the Philippine Republic on January 23rd, 1899. And it should become a surprise to absolutely nobody that the U.S. did not accept this new republic. Now, the war between America and its benevolent colony of Supreme Brotherhood would sort of kind of begin on February 4th, 1899. Two soldiers, Willie Grayson and Orville Miller... Of the 1st Nebraska Volunteers Regiment. Oh, this, I love his popcorn. Because remember, this is like that weird intramural part or inter, interim part of American military history where they're not quite, we, we haven't quite accepted a full standing army. So we have like people deployed 10,000 miles away, but they're like the first Ohio, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so those two guys are manning a checkpoint. Eventually, some Filipino soldiers came walking towards them and the two soldiers began screaming at them telling them they were coming too close to American lines. The problem, of course, was the Filipino soldiers did not speak English, because of course they fucking didn't. And those two white boys didn't speak Spanish or Tagalog, so they might as That's well... That's their been... first thing to do, too. I bet you they even Have do the thing where... Have you tried talking slower? Yeah, yeah, where they go, Hey, <laughs> are you... Like, Stop dude. coming over here. Yeah, they probably, they probably definitely did that. Why are you telling him ovaries? That's actually just how people talk to another Nebraska. <laughs> yeah. That's just Hi. <laughs> yeah. So these two corn fucking idiots from Nebraska opened fire on the Filipino officers, um, killing one and wounding the other one. It should be noted that both of them were unarmed. Way to go, Nebraska. Uh, this is where things. <laughs> yeah, Nebraska started the war. Bet you I never thought you'd fucking hear that one. <laughs> Uh, Grayson ran back to find more soldiers and I'm going to say a quote here from his journal but edit it a little bit for obvious reasons he said quote Why? line up fellas the n-words are here oh my god <laughs> <laughs> what yeah yeah because America's really racist but we're not creative enough to think of different racial slurs they called them good job Nebraska <laughs> yeah they called uh, uh, this is this actually isn't uh, only Nebraska on this one almost every account uh, first-hand account from soldiers, like enlisted men. This kind of sort of gets edited out when they're officers. Call them all. Call Filipinos n-words. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. A true cultured people in America. Yeah. Yeah. So these two idiots. We gotta protect our corn. Protect Western culture, which is invading other people's country, yeah. calling it racial slurs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, these two idiots not only sparked war, but started the first and largest battle of the entire war, the Battle of Manila. Ooh. And that is where we'll pick up next week. That's a cliffhanger. I do my best. Do you? I mean, I try. <laughs> I, I, I like to end it in a cliffhanger. So it's like, I, I, I really like to figure out where this whole thing go, even if they don't like us. Like, well, I already gave an hour to them. So now <laughs> yeah. I have to figure out where this is going. Next time, I'm just going to be like, yeah, and these two guys named Pete and Frank from Nebraska, and we'll talk to you next week. Now, uh, that, that is our cliffhanger. Uh, so tune in next week for part two. That'd be a shit cliffhanger. God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so again, thank you to, I, I originally called him a research assistant, but that isn't fair. Our researcher, Robert, for all of this information. He's and, fucking awesome. Yeah, he's pretty great. Can I say, so we used to have this thing in San Pedro, it's in L.A., we it was called Fort MacArthur Day, old Fort MacArthur days, and mm-hmm. like all these different like eras and different fucking armies, like yeah, yeah, past reenacting. There was a shit ton of dudes who did the Spanish American War, who used to do the uh, Teddy's Rough Riders and shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, those guys were assholes. I mean, now they're even more assholes. To be fair, now. <laughs> it turns out they're just really good at reenacting. Yeah, they, it was weird. They just walked around calling me the N word. Well. <laughs> They were, they were just really committed to the part. They were having a heated gamer moment. Ooh, um, yeah. So, Speaking of which, we got to play. Oh, yeah. So if you have the new Call of Duty, we do as well. And you can go on our Twitter and uh, find our usernames and come lose with us because we're not good. Uh, if you think what we do is worth a You're dollar. You're not good. <laughs> if you think what we do is worth a dollar, you can throw us one on Patreon where you get access to our Discord. You get bonus episodes. If you donate more, you get two bonus episodes a month. You get copies of the book. You get sp- Stickers, all sorts of other stuff. Our new lingerie calendar coming out. Uh, it's only Nick. <laughs> I got, I got pressure. I... Uh, if if you don't want to give us money, that is fine. Our show will always be free. And uh, sh- rate, review, and share us on the iTunes or Hell whatever yeah. other platform you use to listen to fine podcasts. I just recently started doing the YouTube. Yeah, uh, we do I actually have a, like it. We have a YouTube account as well because for some reason YouTube is the most used podcast platform. That's also really interesting. I think it's because most people can access YouTube at work. That's true. Um, and like, it looks really weird if you're glued to your phone if you're at work. But if you have your laptop open or you're on your computer, it just looks like you're working. Mm. In reality, you're hearing us talk about Nebraska racists. <laughs> so that is part one. We will see you next week for part two. Until then, don't shoot any unarmed people. People. Filipinos. Later.